Um, I mean, Andre, what just went into your decision? I know you talked about it a little bit on your podcast, but can you go a little bit further on like what, when did you actually come to this decision? Um, and how much did like Kaminga, Steph and Draymond, like how were they putting, pushing you to make this decision or come back? Um, I don't know. I mean, it was essentially, you know, what I said on the pod and, you know, they had been talking to me a few times this summer and uh, just keeping, we always keep in touch. So I think we were keeping a little bit more in touch, but not really necessarily, necessarily about basketball, but really about just enjoying the summer and kind of what we just accomplished because the way information travels so fast now is it's like you almost forget what we just did. Like we just, we're still the champs and it runs all the way until we're not the champs. So, I mean, I don't know if it's 300 days or 600 days, but, you know, just just basking in it because, you know, uh, when you're going to look back like 25 years from now, you know, it's, it, you're going to wish you embraced it a little bit more. Steve said uh, you basically had retired and they made a final push. I was wondering, you've been playing basketball like all, of your, all of your life, yeah. right? What, what are the emotions when you make a decision like, you know, I'm done? Was it more difficult than you thought or was it easy because it's been so long? No, nah, it was a... Uh... It was a little bit of a roller coaster because I had a lot of stuff going on this summer I, I, and I had a productive summer. And so, you know, I had jumped back and forth like two times and it's, it's, it's literally exhausting to jump back and forth. Like, all right, I'm in. And then I worked out like two times, like hard. And then I was like, for what? And then I went back to what I was doing and I was just, I was super busy. So it wasn't like I had idle time. So I, it wasn't too bad because I was so busy. And then it was just like, all right, just add something to the schedule. And, you know, really got down to like the wire because I don't even know how I was going to reveal it because I didn't really didn't know. And um, I got on the Peloton like two times last week and I was like, oh, I ain't in that bad of shape. So, you know, and then my son's getting older. He's my height now. So I had been showing him some things on the court. So that stuff never leaves. Um, but then like once you're back on the court, you're back on the court. And it's almost like, you know, I was here yesterday. You said that you didn't really want the UD program. What's different from what he does and what you want to do for this team? No, I, I, it wasn't necessarily like a knock on him because what he, he does is, and he actually puts in more work than some of the other guys that are playing a lot. You know what I mean? Like he, he's in two hours early every day. He's, you know, he works out before he gets to the gym. Then he does everything the team does. Uh, so he's actually still capable of playing. You know, I just, um, you know, I have an actual other business that I actually have up and running. And so, it's, you know, I don't have the, the luxury to, you know, be able to, you know, stick around a little bit. Like once I'm done, like I got to go over there and I'm like, I have to, I have to get to that. And, and, and so I think, I think that's what us, like Steve understood. Steph definitely understands it because he sees it. Um, Draymond sees it as well. And um you know, just try. I got to held off at bay for a little while longer, but at some point, like, you know, I got to go full time over there. Have you, in your own mind, at least, sort of have an idea of uh, how much you'll need to back off in terms of games and stuff? Yeah, I, I think that was something that I haven't spoke about as much, but that was probably the largest factor. Like, I actually sat down with Rick. I don't even know how to say Rick's last name. Celebrini, I should know this. I see him every day. But with Rick, he actually sat down and he kind of mapped out a plan. And had he not mapped out that plan, I wouldn't have been as comfortable. And it, it made perfect sense. And uh, he and I have been through a lot in terms of like injuries and, you know, with KD and this thing and that thing and just seeing the other guys. And, you know, we had Clay been out for two years and he, he's dealing with that. So we've seen it all. And then he was an athlete himself. So he had a really good plan at I think that's what kind of sealed the deal. Can, can you help us understand, like, what what happens to, you know, the body of an athlete? I mean, from our side of the table, you look fine, but it looks like you can play, but, you you know, you obviously have to manage that. What, what, what happens when you get to this young age of yours? Yeah, I mean, you just, like, last year was a perfect example. Like, I started off so fast out the gate. Like, I was really good, and I was playing really well. And then I even had practices. Like, I remember one practice, Draymond was like, Andre Iguodala is, is picking us apart. Like, what the hell is going on? Like, I had some really strong days, and they were early on. And then it was – I had, like, major setbacks because, you know, you log in a, a larger load on the body, and then it's just not recovering as fast. So now, you know, 
now you're trying to fight it out as opposed to just, you know, it's December. So take a week off as opposed to taking half a day and then jumping right back in and it just started to compound on top of each other. And once you get there, it takes that to get a bulging disc or it's like that where the knee swells up and you got to get it drained four or five times. And each time you get it drained, it takes longer to get back. And then you, it just, it, things you just can't predict. Whereas to now we kind of have a better plan as, you know, like what's the most important part of the season and then taking it slower. Like we have the luxury with, you know, some of the way the young guys are playing. We had some really good signings in the off season with Dante, with Jermichael. Um, you know, Moses is looking really good. Obviously we have high expectations for, um, for Kaminga. Uh, so, you know, we, we have some pretty good depth uh, that we can really, we don't have to put too much pressure on, on Steph, Clay, you know, Wiggs and uh, we'll still be fine, you know? So it, it's looking like our, our second unit is a little bit stronger, you know, and, and, and that's not a knock on what we had, but uh, I think we had to like, before games last year, we would say, all right, we need Steph to be Superman tonight. And I think we don't have to rely on that as much and he's still going to be him, but I think that's going to be a uh, added luxury for us. Was how you ended the season, like the availability in the postseason, was that motivation to come back again or was that? Uh, not really. You know, it was tough going through it. But then, you know, you look back and take a couple of steps back and, you know, the from the perception of not being in it and letting time pass and then just kind of seeing how we won a championship, it, it all kind of goes away and then you're fine with it. So, um, but there is, you know, the competitor in you that wants to, you know, in on the court and, and being productive. Father time always wins. You mentioned a sort of the thought process that you went through personally to coming to, to this decision. Uh, how much were you getting uh, text calls from your teammates like Stafford or Kaminga and, and others? Yeah, like I said, it really wasn't about basketball when we were kind of communicating uh, every once in a while, but it was more like it was joking. And uh, but it was more about, you know, guys were exploring the world. You know, uh, Clay had a really good summer, you know, uh, being on his boat. Um, and then, you know, the ESPYs was a good time. Uh, Steph was, he had a really good long vacation and, you know, he had his, an amazing golf tour that was really dope to see, you know, what he's doing for the community and for young African-American kids. Um, so, you know, we, we all had really productive summers and it was just more or less keeping up on, you know, how can we help one another or just uh, really uh, embracing what we're all doing and, you know, just enjoying life. Uh, so that conversation didn't come up too much. Was it at all? a factor, you know, you know, as someone who always cares about players and the next generation, are you thinking about maybe it's good for them to see you manage these kind of two careers as opposed to maybe you not playing and managing the careers or something about them seeing you handling both businesses that might be helpful? It's both sides. It's a gift and a curse to it. Um, I took Loon to a software conference and uh, it was a lot of conversation and after like an hour, he said, I said, I'm going to take a nap. Just like, like, we just got here. We got like six hours to go. <laughs> he was like, he's like, I, I can't do all this talking. This is just a lot. But, you know, so it's that side where, you know, you, you're going to put that same energy you did on the court. You apply to something else. You're going to have that success, but it takes that much attention to detail. So um, he has the wherewithal to uh, succeed in whatever he does. And I just wanted to show him something different. And it was a really good experience because he got a lot from it. Um, but most of the younger guys, they, they don't quite get it. Um, but when you sit down with them and you kind of walk them through certain things, they start, I, mean, I saw Moses Moody at, uh, Dreamforce and, uh, he has a friend who's into, uh, STEM and is into coding and he started a company and, and uh, Moses is going to be one of those guys. I think is going to have some success and has a really good understanding of how to connect with the community, especially the one that we have here in the Bay. How do you have just like the energy to handle, you know, being a full-time NBA player, but also all of your other endeavors and helping some of the young guys both on and off the court? Yeah, I, I really don't. But um, yeah, because something always falls off, you know, and then you're just trying to keep things together. But I think it's about putting the right system in place and being efficient with your time. I think that's the biggest thing. You know, uh, I take more notes more than ever now. And then, you know, you have like, just networking and understanding what networking really means. It's not just knowing people and having numbers stored in your phone, but, you know, you have a list of, I don't know, I have a list of like, I don't know, 200 people where it's just like, all right, I got to contact these folks three or four times a year. And then having a, you know, everyone has their team, everyone has their friends, you know, you have an agency, like, are they really providing value because they can help you 
kind of set that schedule out and being just really efficient. So from the time I wake up to the time I go to bed, there's not a minute that's wasted. Andre, as someone who has a lot of things going on off the court, how do you feel about, or what do you think of how Steph handles all of his obligations, all the demands on his time, especially during the off season? Yeah, I, I tell people that all the time, you know, it's pretty amazing how he's, you know, he's one of those guys that's very efficient with his time. Um, and then he's really good at being, I think he's good at taking time off and, you know, he'll, he'll go see the world and, and, you know, he'll, you know, he'll really experience the world. That's one thing I kind of missed. Like I was traveling the world, but playing basketball. And so, you know, it kind of restricted me from going to see a, a historical place or uh, getting a tour guide and really getting a history on something. And I've been trying to do that better late as of late. Um, but Steph, you know, it's, it's just incredible. I think it's just it's a testament to who he is, but at the same time, kind of how he was raised. He saw it with his pops and he has a good balance of, you know, like fame isn't as a, much of importance, you know, for guys who have never seen it. We thinking we just got to get the most of our career, get the most money, sell shoes, things like that. I think he understands that there is a balance there. And, uh, you know, he's done a good job so far. Not to say that, you know, he's still and he's still working towards being more efficient with, with how he does things. You you mentioned um, what, really wanting to cherish the little things this season, whether that be the bus rides, the plane rides, um, going to Oshawa in Chicago. Though I would argue, Little Bad Wolf has a better burger. Bad um, Wolf, Little Bad Wolf, Little Bad Wolf. Yeah, all right, I'm on it. There you I go. No, that's Little Bad Wolf. All right. <laughs> Write it down. Um, gotcha. But what what specifically are you just looking forward to this season? Well, um, started my own production company. Added to that, Little Bad Wolf, right? Okay. And uh, I think with that, just, you know, in the league, they always tell you, you know, once it's over, it's over. And, and you know, the way people view, view you as a current NBA player as opposed to a, a ex NBA player is a totally different experience. You know, you may not be able to get access to some of the same opportunities or some of those doors may close. So, you know, um, with the production company, with the podcast, uh, like using the league as a way to, you know, leverage the league and making sure I make those connections and, and kind of, you know, using that as a trampoline to take that off, you know, help that take off. And that's, you know, whether I'm in the city um, and, and, you know, what do NBA players do in Orlando? You know what I mean? Not a knock on Orlando, but you know, there's everyone sees Disney World when I'm 38, I'm not going to Disney World. But how do I make the most of my time in Orlando from my perspective? You know, like who's a businessman I can connect with? You know what I mean? And then using that experience as a way to create, I'm giving out IP right now, but it's just a, uh, like that's one example of, you know, just making sure I leverage. You got some guys on the league who are doing it just in different ways. You got guys in gaming. You know, JJ Reddick's done a good job in the podcast space. You know, other guys are doing it. I'm doing it in the tech space, you know, when I'm going to, certain cities, uh, you know, even in San Antonio, you know, Austin being close by, you know, I had a few tech uh, meetings there. So just opening some of those doors and, you know, helping people uh, see that. And, you know, with the creator economy that we're in right now, you know, participating in that lane. You kind of joked around with uh, saying that if you get on the court before Jonathan and Moses, that'd be a problem. You know, what has been the message to them and what are your expectations for the two of them specifically? Um, yeah, I was, you know, kind of a little bit joking because I, I actually expect to be on the court, you know, um, but it's just, you know, just kind of helping them understand how cutthroat the league can be, you know, and, and not to say that, you know, if they don't, they fail, but that's just kind of how the league works. You know, you can have a good year one year and the next year it can be a, a totally different type of experience and you may not be getting the minutes you want or another guy might come in the fold, a free agent might come in the fold, a trade might happen that comes in the fold and then now you're out of the loop uh, of what you thought would occur, you know, going into the season. So just being prepared for whatever and keeping them on their toes because that's more the reality of the league as opposed to the, the opposite. And then I know you kind of responded to some outside criticism when it came to Jonathan. What does the outside not understand about him enough when it comes to Kaminga? Yeah, well, I think we, we kind of let the, you know, the third party narrative be the perception of a guy. And you say, okay, this guy should be averaging this, this, and this. And it's like, well, if that person was that smart, they'd be running the team and they would be making a statement in the first place because they'd just be running their team. And I think that occurs with him sometimes. And, you know, uh, there was a clip. I think the Warriors had a clip of him, all his dunks last season. 
And if you look at how those dunks occurred, that isn't the same way that someone else said he should be playing. You know what I mean? Like a lot of his dunks came off cuts, back doors, being a dunker, kind of like the small things. And they were, you know, that's how he had success. But yet you would hear someone else say he needs to have the ball. He needs to be, you know, he needs to have a higher usage. He needs to be using pick and rolls. He needs to be shooting threes. And, the, you know, there's a reason why. And it's not a knock on their IQ, but, you know, these young kids, their careers are shortening. And it's a reason it's because they're trying to chew too much off of it before, you know, it should be occurring. It's like an evolution. And, you know, um, I had a really good conversation with one of his ex in the league and says we got to raise the bottom of our league and it's because we're having too high of a turnover and that's because we're expecting like it took Kobe Bryant a, some years to really become Kobe Bryant you know he was in the league at 17 and we see him at 21 22 and he's in the finals having success but you know 17 18 19 20 you know we saw what happened in Utah you know what I mean and we, we aren't letting these kids uh fail we're, they're failing and we're just criticizing them and writing them off and then they don't have the opportunity. Like we got guys out the league at 21, 22, which is crazy, right? So I think it's just a letting them develop, letting them go through like actual hardships, letting them go through a rookie raw as opposed to, you know, the, he's not focused because he's in a rookie raw. I'm like, no, we, we all got to go through it. It's just a part, part of the maturation process for, you know, our young guys. Someone who's done just about everything in your career, what did you miss? Like on the court, what what is it like passing, playing defense, dunking? Like what's something that you're like, I look forward to doing that again on the court? On the court? Uh no, I need to score more. I'm actually looking forward to that. Um, cause it's just normally I'm just, you know, trying to help a guy like Dante. I've been talking to him and I'm like, you know, you're he's really good. And, you know, I, I have a I have this funny thing with white players where it's just like, yo, it ain't too many of y'all that are really good. But he's he's good. You know what I mean? I'm like, no, you one of the white guys that can actually, like, you, you belong at, like, a high level. You know, it's white guys that belong. But, like, he's really good. And so I think he he kind of went through it where he was playing. Like, the year they won a championship, he was – I think he led the team in minutes. Like, no one knows that. And he started, right? And that's what I'm talking about, Moses and Jonathan Kaminga. You know, he went from starting. And then the next year, you know, he had a, he had a crazy injury. And then it kind of, like, you know, confidence can just – throw you off a little bit. And then last year he he's, you know, he's trading, he's on, he's on a trade block and, you know, he's trying to figure out what's going on with the team he's been with, not even a team he just got traded to. And then he gets traded and he's trying to figure out his career. And then now he's a free agent. He was looking at a bigger contract and now he's kind of in limbo. But I think here is a place where he can kind of reestablish himself. Like Jeff Green went through it. He was on the minimum. Then he went he went back up to, you know, he's got a nice size contract. JaVale McGee went through it. And, like, these are real NBA players that, for some reason, the perception, again, kind of it gets the best of those guys. So, you know, going back to me scoring more, but he's the guy that I naturally – I'm going to feed him on purpose because, you know, he can do a lot for us. And as many opportunities as, as I can give him, I am. And and, and it's going to help other guys see what he can do as well. But, you know, other than him and some of my young guys, I'm looking forward to, you know, just getting back on the court and uh, – Looking to score more. Yeah, I, I'm really all I've been like that the last couple of years. And I think that's why I've had some success. Like in Miami, we go back to the finals and people were like, you know, uh, are you surprised? And I'm like, no, I, I really just play for the joy of the game. And, um, you know, I've had some big shots in my career. And I think that's a result of having that mindset. Like, well, if I miss, then, then you know, like, what are you really going to say to me? Oh, uh, I, I'm really, we're all good at basketball. So when we miss a shot. Most guys miss or are afraid of the moments because they're afraid of the backlash or what someone might say if it doesn't go their way. And that's like the worst way to operate to profession. And so you put in the work and it's going to pay off when you get out there. And uh, I think that rings true for them. You know, it's just really the work you put in and just going out there playing with confidence. Yeah. Yeah, be cool.